All right. Um, so again, um, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, these uh, these kinds of parts, and I just uh, I'm not going to repeat everything because you saw this slide already. Um, I do. I do uh, we we did that part. I'm going to repeat. We did talk a lot about uh, about interference effects of, uh, of uh, scattered fields and scattered uh, uh, by different particles or within a particle. Uh, all of that is uh, is left out of this picture. Uh, that that any any of these effects occurring are assumed to be accounted for by the optical properties. So it's already in the scattering coefficient. It is already in the phase function. It is already in the anisotropy, etc. So no um, uh, no coherent effects here. Um, I want to uh, yeah. I want to illustrate uh, uh, this this approach using um, uh, using this technique. It's called single fiber uh, reflectance spectroscopy, and it is uh, as simple as an uh, optical experiment as you can uh, as you can get. It has a, a broadband light source, so that outputs uh, wavelengths uh, in the visible wavelength range from let's say 400 to 700, 800. Uh, nanometers. Uh, that light is um, coupled into an optical fiber, uh, uh, and uh, via that fiber, uh, there is a small uh, splitter unit here. Uh, it is guided towards the tissue. Uh, light enters the tissue, is scattered around. Some of it is absorbed, some of it is uh, reflected, uh, and it is picked up by the same fiber, uh, by the same fiber here that is in contact with the tissue. And the light is guided back up, uh, and then in this splitter, it is directed towards a uh, uh, towards the spectrometer where it is detected. So the uh, so the setup is uh, pretty simple, but as we'll see, the, um, the 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 physical model that actually describes the signal is not so is not so simple. So um, uh, so uh, this is a uh, typical example of the um, uh, of the uh, absorbers that uh, we can uh, encounter in tissue. So uh, in this wavelength range from in this case, it's 400 to, to over, over 900 nanometers. You have all these absorbers that all give different uh, spectral signatures that can all be hopefully be detected by this, uh, by this technique. And we have the, uh, the familiar uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, uh, the protein in blood, but there's also uh, in skin, there is also melanin in two forms, eumelanin and pheomelanin, which have slightly different absorption spectra. There is um, uh, bilirubin in there as a breakdown product of hemoglobin. Uh, and, and uh, beta carotene can also give a, give a, a distinct signature. So these are uh, these are the absorption um, uh, absorbing components that uh, that can be present in tissue and that can just be um, uh, can just be detected hopefully by uh, by such a technique. Uh, one quick question for you: If you would draw uh, now the scattering coefficient as a function of wavelength in this wavelength region, how would that approximately look like? I'd wager a higher scattering coefficient means a better scattering efficiency. So, uh, so if I would redraw figure one point one, I guess I'd say scattering efficiency is slowly declining. Uh, so a it has a downward slope. Yeah, as a function of wavelength. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So the so in the visible part, uh, in the visible part of the wavelength range, the scattering. Um, uh, uh, decreases with wavelength. Uh, so for small particles, for the very small particles, we had this uh, this uh, lambda to the uh, power minus four uh, dependence of the scattering uh, efficiency. So that uh, that translates into the into the scattering uh, cross section, of course, and also the scattering coefficient. So for for the very small particles, the Rayleigh scatterers, uh, the scattering coefficient will scale with lambda to the power minus four. Uh, for the for the bigger particles, that uh, that slope is not so strong, but it is still a downward slope. So let's say uh, inversely proportional to uh, for, uh, proportional to lambda to the power minus two, something like that. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, so is this not working? Um, I just want to quickly show you one example where this uh, where this is used uh, in the clinic. Um, uh, this is in an. Uh, uh, in, in a research we did recently uh, into so-called Barrett's esophagus, uh, it is an um, uh, it is it is a kind of inflammation of the of the esophagus, uh, 
pretty near where the esophagus, the slug darm, uh, connects with the stomach. Uh, so due to diet or, or for other reasons, people can have a, a chronic reflux. So the, uh, the, the acids from the uh, uh, from the stomach are yeah, going up in the uh, uh, are going up in the in the esophagus in the slug darm, uh, and that uh, uh, that gives problems because uh, the, the tissue of the stomach is is of course uh, has has of course evolved to uh, to take care of that acid uh, acid environment, but uh, the tissues of the esophagus are uh, are, re are really different. So if that is exposed to this acid, then it can uh, it can give chronic inflammation and after that it can even lead to uh, uh, to cancer. So people uh, with this uh, uh, Barrett's esophagus uh, condition have about 50% increased uh, chance to develop cancer uh, in the esophagus. Um, now the development uh, of, um, uh, of cancer from so from this uh, from this uh, initial condition to, uh, to cancer is in uh, go, goes in, in quite distinguish, uh, distinguishable steps in time that are all associated with really uh, structural changes inside the tissue. Um, and the idea of course as always is that if we can measure these changes using optical techniques then maybe we can uh, uh, can do diagnostic uh, diagnosis of um, uh, of this condition and maybe help uh, steer uh, treatment. Um, so so, uh, so there's basically about four steps. So the, the first is uh, uh, Non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus. Dysplastic means that uh, the tissue is uh, abnormal looking. It's just a medical term for tissue that is not normal. Uh, so in this case, the tissue is, is still looking pretty normal, but there is some inflammation. Uh, after that, um, uh, low-grade uh, dysplasia can occur. So that is tissue that, that already is, uh, is altering, uh, already appears different. Uh, low-grade, uh, the grade is associated with the aggressiveness of uh, of a cancer, so if it is low grade, it is not uh, is it's not not that aggressive yet. So basically, if you're still in these uh, uh, in these um, stages of development, then the treatment is very well possible. Uh, uh, then high grade is is the more more aggressive form, and then uh, uh, in the end, it will be um, it will uh, become cancer. Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, so what we did is uh, uh, set up a study to see if we could use this uh, this uh, single fiber reflectance spectroscopy to, uh, to 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 measure these tissues and see if from the spectra that we then uh, that we then can derive uh, if we can if we can correlate that to the uh, to the state of the disease. So it's kind of a screening tool. Or the idea was that it could be some kind of screening tool uh, that that uh, yeah, that allows you to determine in which of these four stages uh, uh, four stages you are. Uh, so the good thing about such a such a uh, uh, small setup is that that you only have one optical fiber to do your measurements, so you can very easily incorporate that uh, into into let's say the working channel of an endoscope, where normally an instrument uh, or a would go up. You can now put your uh, put that fiber, uh, and you can then pretty easily reach uh, reach these um, uh, reach this uh, location these locations. Uh, so. Now, here are some examples of what you can uh, what you can expect if you do uh, if you do these measurements. Uh, so if you take a look at the left um, uh, figure first, uh, figure A, that shows five measurements, five individual measurements, the different colors, uh, and it shows also measurements that are done with two different uh, fiber diameters. So actually, it is not. Uh, uh, it's actually we call the, the, this that variant of the technique is called a multi-diameter uh, single fiber reflectance. So you. Uh, you don't mix the fiber diameters, but you do. Uh, uh, you do use two fibers. Uh, the reason for that is uh, uh, that lies actually in the modeling of the of the signal. The modeling is so complicated that uh, that it is uh, over um, parameterized. Uh, so you cannot you cannot solve uh, uh, for the for the spectra and for the optical properties uh, uh, without adding extra information, and that extra information is then added. Uh, in the form of a, of a second fiber with a different diameter, so a second set of measurements uh, with a different diameter. Uh, so because they have different uh, diameters, they will measure uh, different uh, reflectances. That means that uh, if the fiber is bigger, it can collect more light, so it will, so the reflectance it will measure will be higher. Um, it also means, unfortunately, that they will not probe the same uh, volume exactly because the light. Uh, as we'll see a little bit later on, from the larger fiber can uh, can penetrate a little bit deeper before it is uh, reflected and detected again. Um, but then the good the good thing and the, the actual uh, goal of this is that uh, uh, that it um, 
uh, reduces the uh, uh, the number of uh, the number of parameters in the in the, in the model. Um, yeah. So the idea is then to uh, to take these uh, to take these measurements uh, and then uh, fit a mathematical model to that, which has the tissue uh, optical properties as parameters. Uh, uh, and as you can see here on the in the in the panel on the right, uh, panel B. Uh, so in red is the measurement. So that is then the average of uh, five of these measurements on the left. Um, in the red are the measurements for the two fibers, and the uh, and the dotted lines here, the black dotted lines, are the fits or the model fits. Uh, and as you can see, that uh, that in many cases that uh, that really does not um, work so well. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of um, uh, reasons for that, but uh, uh, which also have to do with the instrumentation. But but one of the uh, one of the important reasons, unfortunately, is is that the model is really complicated and uh, has a lot of degrees of freedom. So uh, somehow the optimization routine thinks that this is a, this is a good fit and then stops optimizing. Uh, but of course, from visual inspection, you can already see that it is not uh, uh, it is not really good enough. So what goes into this model? Well, that that's that's the known spectra of uh, uh, of hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, melanin, etc. Uh, and a couple of assumptions uh, go in there. So we assume that the scattering uh, is, is a decreasing function of wavelength, as, uh, as we saw in the previous, uh, the previous slide. Uh, so these assumptions go in the model and that, uh, uh, that will yield an optimization. So this would, this would uh, then be a typical result for, that, um, uh, for, for the model outcome. Uh, so you have the uh, list of parameters here that, that are uh, optimized in the, uh, in the fitting. So A and B are the uh, are the parameters that are uh, that are over here for the for the scattering? Uh, P1, P2, and P3 are a little bit uh, uh, boringly named parameters that uh, describe uh, scattering as well. But there is, they describe the phase function, uh, and then there is parameters such as blood volume fraction, uh, oxygen saturation, uh, an average vessel diameter, uh, concentration of hemoglobin, uh, a bilirubin concentration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, Etc. So all these parameters come out with with varying uh, degrees of accuracy, um, and also with varying degrees of success, as you can see in the in the figure of the fit. So one of the things that we really uh, really want to do is have a better model for this uh, for this uh, system for this measurement technique. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. This is not so not so relevant. Um, so this fit, this fit model that uh, that is used now uh, is a model with 18 parameters that are all uh, individually optimized. Uh, there are eight parameters to model uh, scattering, uh, so the scattering coefficient and the phase function. Uh, there are six parameters that uh, mo uh, model the absorption of blood. There's hemoglobin concentrations, there's oxygen saturations, and uh, vessel diameters. They are all different for the two fiber diameters uh, because they uh, they see different volumes. Uh, then there is the volume fraction of water uh, in the tissue that uh, is, a, is a main uh, absorbing uh, compound, of course. Uh, the absorption coefficient of water is temperature dependent, so temperature is also in there. Uh, and, and then all kinds of other, um, uh, all kinds of other parameters as well. Uh, so this, this, these, 18 uh, these 18 parameters in this, in this model are fitted or optimized in order to, uh, to match uh, the model to the spectrum. And then, uh, and, and then we conclude that these are then actually the, um, uh, are, are, are then actually the parameters. Uh, but from a mathematical point of view, uh, you, you can just wonder uh, if you would just fit a 20th order polynomial to the data, that would, uh, that would also give a good fit. Uh, of course, it would have no information, but uh, from, from the data processing point of view, uh, actually uh, we <laughs> need a better model. This, this, this 18 parameter model is not, uh, is not working. Uh, so what we uh, set out to do is um, is, uh, is try to, uh, to 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 derive from scratch uh, a new model for this uh, geometry, um, with with some success uh, I think. Uh, uh, so I want to uh, show you uh, basically how we how we did it, or uh, and, and also some results of that. Uh, so again, what we're going to do is uh, is uh, trace uh, photons through the tissue. Uh, and then ask again questions like what is the likelihood of a given photon path, uh, distribution of lengths between collusions, probabilities of absorption, etc. Um, so these are the uh, 
uh, these are the things that we uh, we can expect. Uh, so if we have uh, if we have if you would have a, a measurement where we have two fibers, one fiber uh, that uh, that uh, that launches uh, light and one that detects light, uh, then uh, we can make simulations uh, of the of the photon trajectories uh, through uh, through a piece of tissue. Uh, and here in the colors, you see all kinds of different photon trajectories that can occur. Uh, so you can see that they can be long winding, they can be short, uh, they can have uh, large steps, small steps, they can have big deflection angles, small deflection angles, everything uh, bas basically occurs there. Uh, but if you now go to the, uh, to the, to the single fiber uh, geometry, uh, that is then panel B, uh, and do the same kind of simulation, then, uh, then you see a, a kind of a different picture. You see that the, uh, the paths themselves are much shorter. Uh, they, um, they are less, uh, uh, less complicated. It's more, more like uh, going in on a, on, a, on a straight line down and then, uh, then, uh, and then going back up. Uh, so, so, it is a, so we were looking at these, um, uh, at these simulations and then we figured uh, maybe, maybe if we can, uh, uh, can find a way to model the, this behavior in panel B for the, for the photon path length, then maybe we can have a, a good approach to, uh, to, uh, to making this new model. Uh, so before, uh, uh, before we go there, uh, it's, it's first good to, uh, to, to look once more at, uh, at uh, the law of Lambert Beer and, uh, and define what, uh, what we actually mean by the likelihood of a signal or the likelihood of a photon path. So, so this one you know, of course, this is a cuvette with an absorbing substance, a uh, absorption coefficient mu a, length L of the cuvette and the light just goes through. Uh, now let's say that uh, uh, that out of every hundred photons that we send through this cuvette, only one is transmitted, uh, and 99 of them are uh, absorbed inside the cuvette. Uh, so that means that uh, uh, that that if you would calculate that uh, with using Lambert Beer, that would mean that uh, that e over e zero, the intensity on the uh, on the backside of the cuvette divided by the incident intensity, would uh, would also be this one out of hundred, point uh, oh one. Uh, so basically, this is the this is then the connection between um, uh, between the likelihood of the signal. If we can calculate the probability of transmission, uh, so if we can if we can calculate how likely it is that the photon is uh, is uh, transmitted in this experiment, then we actually calculated an estimate of the signal that we would measure, because this one over hundred uh, that that we uh, that we derive from uh, from Beer's law here is the same as as the one over hundred that we could possibly derive here using. Uh, uh, using the, the the statistics. So how do you then calculate the probability of an event? Well, there is a uh, there is a nice recipe to do that. Uh, uh, first, you break uh, the total event that you want to calculate. So let's say uh, let's say the event that we want to calculate is uh, the probability, the likelihood that photons enter here uh, and are the, uh, and escape here. I want to know what the likelihood of that happening is, what the probability of that happening is. Um, so I can break uh, this, uh, this event. The event is now that photons travel from here to here, uh, let's say along this path. Uh, I can break that in sub-events and I can calculate the probability of each sub-event. Uh, so in this case, that would be the probability of traveling to site number one without anything happening, then scattering at one, and then traveling to site number two without anything happening, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if I can, if I calculated uh, the probabilities of these sub-events, then I can uh, can uh, find the total probability by multiplying uh, these sub-event probabilities. Uh, I can only do that. Uh, that's that's the, the warning sign there. I can only do that when these sub-events are uncorrelated. Uh, but I'm going to assume that this is uh, that this is the case. Uh, so that would give me the probability of this this one drawn photon path. But if I was interested. In, more in the probability of uh, of actually photons entering here and ex exiting there, uh, then there is more than one way to get uh, uh, to get there. There is more than one possible photon path. So I would have to calculate then uh, the probabilities of all the other possible paths as well, uh, and then I'm allowed, uh, and after that I'm allowed to add these probabilities to get the total uh, the total probability of uh, of in this case photons entering here uh, and escaping there. So basically, uh, the approach is going to be we're going to uh, uh, we're going to look at, uh, at, an, uh, at an event, try to break that down in small sub-events and calculate the probability of each sub-event. Uh, these uh, can then be multiplied to, uh, to get the event probability. And if the event can happen in more than one ways, then uh, we have to do that uh, 
we have to add these. Um, so if you now take at this, uh, this single photon path, uh, that would then uh, indeed um, uh, be the product of all these independent step, that, uh, independent uh, uh, events that make up the path. So I can write that probability uh, like this. Uh, this uh, you see a lot of multiplications here and a lot of uh, individual probabilities. Uh, for example, this here is the probability uh, of a step size L1. So L1 is uh, then here. Uh, the probability of step size one without interaction. Uh, then the next factor uh, is the probability of a scattering event occurring at, uh, at that uh, position one, uh, uh, R1. Um, then the term after that is the probability of scattering from the direction S1 into the direction S2. So that is from the direction that, that uh, pointed to, uh, uh, to location number one into the direction that points from one to location number two uh, and there uh, and uh, and then uh, once once I have this uh, direction then uh, then the next step is again a propagation over length uh, uh, l2 here so p l2 uh, gets there and then times the probability of scattering at two times the probability of changing direction to s3 from s2 etc 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 so this way by by, by uh, uh, identifying all these uh, sub event uh, probabilities I can uh, calculate the probability of the total of the total path. Um, so in this case, uh, if, if I want to calculate uh, as a detected signal the probability that photo, uh, the detected signal in this uh, geometry, I would uh, calculate the probability that photons that are launched at point number A are detected at point number B. Uh, so it means adding all the probabilities of all possible paths from A to B, and for a single one of these paths. Uh, we, we split it. Uh, we split it in the product of all these independent, independent uh, uh, substeps. Um, okay. Well, if that is the recipe, uh, and that is the recipe that we uh, want to follow, then there is uh, basically uh, two uh, uh, two ways we can go from here. Uh, we can try to uh, to find analytical expressions uh, from this recipe, uh, or we can uh, 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 let the computer uh, generate all these probabilities. Uh, and then in that case, we're doing Monte Carlo simulations. Then we let the computer generate many random uh, paths. And then if we add all these together, then uh, uh, we get the same result. Uh, so what I, what I actually want to do today is uh, both. Uh, so first, uh, uh, see how far we can get in finding some analytical expressions uh, from this recipe. And then um, uh, find, uh, in, in the end, uh, uh, how a Monte Carlo simulation would approach this. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, step uh, uh, back again um, and uh, to, to our cuvette. Um, and suppose that uh, PA uh, here in blue is defined as the probability of absorption uh, per unit length along a photon path. Uh, and that photon path can be uh, just a straight line through a cuvette, but it can also be uh, one of these uh, complicated paths inside a tissue. Uh, PA is the probability of absorption per unit length along such a path. Um, that means that uh, if, if that was a distribution, uh, then PA uh, function of LDL would be the probability uh, of absorption uh, somewhere between L and L plus DL, just uh, uh, following the definition of a probability density function. Uh, and also we could, uh, we could uh, def uh, conversely, we can interpret PA of L as the probability density function for, uh, for, for free path lengths. So it is either absorption or not absorption. So if, uh, uh, if, 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 if P A of L times D L is the, is the probability that the event actually takes place at uh, somewhere between L and L plus D L, uh, then that, that implies that there was no absorption before that. So the free length, uh, um, so the probability of the free length is, the, is then the same. It's normalized, of course, because it is a true probability density function. Um, uh, it's then normalized on L, uh, and also all possible values uh, of L lie somewhere between zero path length and infinite path length. There are no negatives, so the integration boundaries uh, would then run from zero to, uh, to infinity. Um, but let's make it a little bit simpler. We'll just assume that uh, uh, that it, is, uh, it does not depend on the spatial position. It is just a constant that is equal all uh, at all locations in the in the medium. Okay. Um, so if P 
A times DL is the probability of absorption uh, in an interval DL. Uh, then my question to you is, what is then one minus the A DL? First, the probability of not having an absorption along the path length. Yeah, so. it's, yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it's, it's a, the simplest way of saying it is uh, if, if PADL is the probability of absorption, then one minus PADL is the probability of not absorption. So let's just uh, just write it like this. It's the probability of not absorbing in an interval DL. Um, okay, what is then? Um, uh, what, what, what is then the if that is the case, what is then the interpretation of this expression? So one minus PADL times uh, one minus PADL. Uh, yeah, it's the probability of not absorbing uh, between uh, interval LDL when moving the, this path length twice, right? So the photon moves through it, is not absorbed, and then again it moves through and is not absorbed again. Yeah, yeah. So here you already see that, that that's uh, that's entirely correct. Uh, and here you also see uh, this uh, this uh, breaking up in sub events. So the, so um, I'm 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 moving my photon now over a over a segment of two times dl, but I'm breaking it up in two segments of dl, uh, for which uh, I say the probability. Uh, 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 the, uh, the, the probability of, of it absorbing in in segment number two does not depend on whether or not it uh, uh, does not depend on the properties of segment number one. So these are independent uh, quantities, and that means that I can multiply them to get the total probability. Yeah. So uh, so this is basically just the probability of not absorbing in an interval two times dl. Um, and again, this uh, this is the yeah I just mentioned that. Okay. Um, so what we can do now is, uh, is uh, we take, uh, let's take a longer path uh, and break that path up in, uh, in segments, all of length DL. So let's, uh, let's assume that that, 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 that will result in N, uh, capital N segments. That means that, uh, the probability of, uh, this should be zero, of course, uh, the probability of not absorbing, uh, between zero and L is then, uh, uh, N times DL. Sorry, the probability of not absorbing between L and L is N times the L is then uh, breaking it up in all these small segments. So, uh, uh, and then multiplying, which uh, if you do that N times uh, uh, is equivalent to raising, uh, to, to raising to the power N. So the probability of not absorbing is then one minus PADL to the power of N. Yep. Um, now, we can do some manipulation. It can, uh, we can uh, take the natural logarithm on both sides of that equation so that the uh, so that the, uh, the exponent uh, uh, becomes uh, just a prefactor. Uh, and then if the, uh, I can choose uh, DL as small as I like, it is just an incremental, uh, just an ele elemental path length. So I can choose it in such a way that PADL is very small. Uh, and, that, uh, and that means that I can approximate LN of y one minus a very small number. Uh, I can just approximate that as, uh, as minus uh, PADL. Uh, so I got rid of the LN on this side of the, on the right hand side of the equation. Um, so this, approxim this approximation holds when the L is very small. Uh, then I can exponentialize both sides of the equation again, uh, and then uh, then have that uh, P is, is approximately uh, exponential PA times N times uh, the L. Uh, then of course, N times the L was equal to the, to the total length L. So uh, in the end, this probability uh, of not absorbing between zero and L is going to be exponential minus PA times L. Uh, now, of course, if you compare this to, uh, to Beer's law, to Lambert Beer's law, then we had uh, that, that, that probability was also the same as uh, exponential minus uh, the absorption coefficient times L. So that simply means that this, this, uh, this probability of absorption per unit length uh, that, 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 that we introduced uh, in a general way is simply the absorption coefficient. So the absorption coefficient is the absorption, uh, is the probability of uh, absorption per unit length along the path. And it does not matter if that path is uh, straight in the cuvette or if that path is uh, 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 very complicated inside, inside the tissue. Okay, uh, so that means that uh, uh, we can now uh, just use mu a instead of, uh, instead of this uh, general probability. 
Uh, that means that uh, the likelihood of transmission is uh, exponential minus uh, absorption coefficient times L. So just Lambert Beer's law again. Um, if that is the probability, or if that is the likelihood of transmission, then, uh, then the likelihood of the probability of not transmission uh, or equivalently absorption somewhere in the cuvette uh, is uh, equal to one minus uh, exponential uh, minus mu a times L. Uh, and you'll note the capital P, uh, this, this, is the, uh, this, is an, um, this is again a cumulative distribution function because it, it sums up all the probabilities of, of absorption. It is the probability of absorption somewhere uh, between zero and L, somewhere in the cuvette, somewhere along zero and L. Um, uh, and of course, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, cumulative distribution function was related to the probability density function. Uh, through this integral, integral uh, relation, so the integral from zero to L of uh, PL dL, which means that we can uh, differentiate this expression in order to get um, uh, to get uh, the likely the the, the true uh, probability density function for um, uh, for uh, for absorption per unit length. So that would be uh, can result in this equation. As you can see, it now has mu a also as a prefactor, uh, and if you uh, uh, you can verify that this function actually is uh, is normalized, so it is a true uh, probability density function. Um, so, what does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, mu a times dl is the probability uh, of absorption in an interval dl. Uh, it also means that uh, mu a times exponential minus mu a times l is the probability density function uh, for a free path length L until absorption. So the, the distribution of lengths that photons fly before an absorption event occurs. Um, PLDL is then, of course, the probability of finding a free path length until absorption in an interval uh, from L to L plus DL. So the likelihood of getting that, uh, that uh, free path. Uh, this was the commutative distribution function. Uh, uh, for, uh, for, for that absorption event, or uh, if you want, uh, uh, you can also define it as the probability that the photon is absorbed somewhere between zero uh, and L. Um, so now with this, uh, uh, with this set of equations, um, can you quickly calculate uh, the expectation value for the mean path length? So we have this, uh, we have this function uh, for the uh, probability density of the, of, the, uh, of the free path length. Uh, can you now calculate the expectation value? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for that. Not entirely straightforward. But, um... So can you uh, can you, can you tell me tell, can you tell me what actually we should be calculating now? So what, what what would be the start yeah, point? So that's an integral of L times the uh, PD, PDF of L. So yeah. you have L L. Yeah. Usually in an integral you use prime. So L prime P L prime. DL prime. 
Yeah. Oh, this is... And if you plug uh, this in, you get you get uh, it's pretty easy to substitute mu a times l prime with with for example x. Okay, this is <laughs> okay. This is really bad. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, correct. Um, did you get an answer? Um? Uh, yeah, so at the moment I'm uh, still at the substitution. Uh. Okay, I'm sorry. Then I'll, I'll let you, uh, I think you're closed in, uh, so I'll let you just go. Uh, so you can also write it like that. Uh, I'm missing a factor here, I think. Um, Okay, I see uh, Sharon uh, gave an answer in the in the chat. You, uh, if I read correctly, you say your uh, expectation value is one over mu a. Uh, yeah, but it was before I did any calculations. This was just my definition of the uh, mean free path length. So ah, okay. <laughs> that's, not, that's sort of cheating. But uh, I, I see now that that is the answer you want to. Yeah, you can solve this uh, this integral. Um, oh, look at you. You can solve this integral uh, this integral using uh, using the Ketting regel, the chain rule of integration. And then, uh, I'm, uh, uh, in view of the time, I think I'm just going to let you do that as uh, as a homework question because. Uh, uh, the, the, the result indeed is uh, you are uh, absolutely right uh, Sharon is uh, one over mu a. So that mean, uh, yeah, so the expectation value, uh, the mean value of three path length is one over, one over mu a. Uh, and luckily that also works out unit wise, mu a had units of uh, per meter, so one over mu a has units meter, so that's actually, actually indeed a length. Um, so that was for absorption. Uh, we can do a uh, same kind of uh, derivation for, uh, for scattering. Uh, I'm gonna do it in a slightly different way. Uh, so let's start with a particle with a scattering efficiency QS. So that means QS was, uh, was the ratio of scattered power over incident power. Uh, but you can also interpret it then uh, that um, uh, if, if, if if, if a photon is considered as a particle that carries a certain amount of uh, uh, a certain amount of energy, then you can you could also interpret Q uh, as the fraction of photons that uh, that is uh, uh, that is scattered upon, upon encountering a particle. 
Uh, so if the scattering, again, if the scattering efficiency is, let's say 1%, then only one out of every 100 photons that, uh, that, uh, that, that encounters a particle is actually scattered. Uh, and the rest is just, uh, and the rest just continues. Uh, so let's, uh, let's use this, uh, this uh, interpretation. Um, suppose you have um, a suspension of particles and these particles have uh, a geometrical cross section A and a certain density rho. Um, then we can carve a path of length L that can have any shape through the suspension that precisely captures some particles. So uh, that we're making kind of a cylindrical path along, uh, along uh, through, uh, through the sample and every time it, uh, it captures uh, some of these particles. So it's a little bit, uh, it looks, like this is where the, uh, a game my, uh, my son uh, likes to play on his phone, uh, where, where the snake has to catch, uh, eat up all these particles. Uh, so it's more or less that, uh, that, uh, that, that picture. Uh, so so let, we make this uh, snake uh, have a volume V, which, which is then uh, given by the length L of the, of the snake and, and the cross section A that exactly matches the particles. Uh, so, the, so the volume is uh, A times L. Uh, which means that the average number of particles in that snake is then rho times v is rho times a times rho times a times l. Uh, so that's the average number of particles. Um, so what is then the average number of scattering events? So if a, if a photon would, uh, would travel down that snake, what would then be the average uh, number of scattering events? So we now know how many particles there are, and we know what uh, this uh, factor q is. Then that will simply be Q multiplied with the average number of particles um, yeah. by the snake. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so that would be just so the average number would be just Q times uh, uh, time row times a row times a times l, um, uh, as as we defined it above. And then of course now we can use our familiar definitions. We we also know that Q times uh, a because we made the snake. Uh, Precisely match the geometrical cross section of the particles. So Q times A is the scattering uh, uh, is the is the is the scattering cross section, and rho times the scattering cross section uh, is uh, is the scattering coefficient mu s. Uh, so the average number of events in this snake uh, is uh, is uh, mu s times L. So the product of the length and the scattering coefficient is uh, is is the uh, the average number of scattering events. Um, can we now calculate the average path length between scattering events if we know this? So we have a total length L, we have N on average, we have N events. So what is then the length between the events? Yeah, so the total length Length divided by the average number of scattering events. Yeah, yeah, so that would be L over N then. Huh? So you just you split the you, you split L in N uh, in N uh, yeah, so L over N. Uh, which means that uh, so that would be the average path between scattering events would be L over N. And if you uh, if you uh, rearrange the formula here, then that means that is again equal to one over the scattering coefficient, one over mu s. Uh, so it is exactly the same as in the case with absorption. So one over the coefficient is uh, is the expectation value uh, of propagation between uh, between the events. Uh, in this case, uh, in this case for scattering. Um, okay, I can't get all. Um, we can make it a little bit more complicated. Uh, if these uh, particles are uh, uh, randomly placed. Uh, then the distribution of the uh, then the distribution of the number of particles will follow uh, a Poisson distribution. So if you have, uh, on average, uh, uh, have uh, n uh, so n between brackets particles on average per unit volume, uh, and if you then look at uh, look at the sub volume within the volume, you can uh, count how many particles there actually are. Uh, and if you can make then a distribution over all, over many sub volumes, then you will get a a Poisson distribution of the actual number of particles per unit volume. Um, and it, 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 this, looks, this looks a lot like the, uh, the, the example we did earlier on uh, in the lecture hall, if you remember. Um, 
then of course, if there are n particles, uh, of, of if, the, if the number of particles per unit volume follows a, a Poisson distribution, then the number of scattering events per unit volume will also uh, follow a Poisson distribution. It will be weighted with the efficiency, but uh, the form of the distribution does not necessarily change. Um, and now we can also see that if we, know, uh, if, if we know the distribution of the number of events, we can also calculate uh, what, what the likelihood is of, of having no events. And having no events would just mean uh, a free propagation, free transmission along a, a certain length L without encountering any particles at all, uh, or, or without getting any scattering events at all, is so better, uh, better formulated. Uh, so we can uh, fill in zero here uh, in, the, in, the, in this distribution. Uh, and then again, we end up with the same uh, same kind of expression. So exponential one of exponential minus uh, the average number of events, and we had from the previous uh, uh, from the previous result was that that um, that the average number of events was mu s times l. So uh, here we get uh, again a Lambert Beer type type of uh, type of expression now with the scattering coefficient instead of the absorption coefficient. Uh, but other than that, the result is exactly the same. Uh, so the probability of no 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 interactions, no scattering uh, occurring uh, over a length L is exponential minus mu s times L, just like the uh, just like the probability of no absorption was um, exponential minus mu a times L. Okay, so now if we if we now know that we can uh, we can slightly uh, uh, walk the argument back. Uh, down this route, so we know that um, uh, just like for absorption, for scattering, we can uh, have the probability density function for the uh, for the for the free lengths, the free path lengths in between scattering events, given by this uh, Beer type of law. Of course, it has to be normalized, so the mu s uh, is there in front as well. We can calculate the cumulative distribution function for the scattering free path length uh, by integrating the, the blue expression. From zero to L, then we get one minus exponential uh, minus mu s times L. So that is then the probability that the scattering free path uh, falls somewhere in the range between zero and L, which is cumulative, uh, or um, uh, or equivalently the probability that a scattering event occurs somewhere in the range from uh, zero to L. Uh, so one minus that uh, cumulative distribution function. Uh, is then the probability that the scattering event occurs does not occur in the range from zero to L, uh, and that we can then again equate to the probability of scatter-free propagation over length L. So it's the same, uh, same expression, but now the uh, uh, approach from the other side. So now let's see if we can apply that to, uh, uh, to single fiber uh, reflectance spectroscopy. See if we can find uh, use this to find a uh, uh, to find a model uh, uh, for this uh, for this geometry, um, what we're going to do is uh, uh, is make a few simplifying assumptions because otherwise it uh, it will not work. Uh, we're going to assume that uh, the signal consists only of photons that uh, that have been backscattered only once. So photons can scatter in the forward direction an arbitrary number of times, but there is only one scatter backscattering event that reverses the direction of the uh, of the photons. Uh, we can do that because, in general, the anisotropy of tissues, the, the G of tissues, is, is, is pretty high for, for 0 0.8 to 0 0.9. Uh, so that means that most of the scattering will occur uh, more or less. So the average cosine of the scattering angle is close to one. So most of the scattering will occur in the forward direction. Um, so that means that the probability, uh, if you want to, if, if the light goes in this way and you want to have it out uh, this way, uh, that can either be one backscatter event or uh, one, two, three backscatter events or five backscatter events. You need an odd number of backscattering events in order to uh, for the light to, uh, to to go back to that measurement fiber. Uh, and because of this high anisotropy value, the uh, the probability of three or five uh, or seven uh, backscattering events is just very small compared to only one backscatter event. So that's the first assumption. Um, also, because of this high anisotropy, uh, we are going to uh, look at propagation uh, just along a line. So, not uh, so there is not going to be a lot of deflections. We assume that uh, if the light is deflected too much, it will never reach the the, the measurement fiber again. So, we don't uh, need to include uh, these photons in our model. We only look at uh, photons that travel along a line. 
Uh, and also the first, uh, the first assumption uh, is going to be that there is no absorption to make it a little bit easier, uh, but we'll add absorption later. Um, of course, this is a lot of simplifying assumptions. So this, is, uh, this will not model this, this signal completely. It will only model a part of it. Uh, and, and the full model is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is more complex. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, well, let's look at this cartoon again. So uh, uh, we have to break up uh, our uh, trajectory in, uh, in different, uh, in different uh, events, sub-events. So scatter-free propagation to 0.1. Uh, over length L1, then scattering at one, uh, then a change of direction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this was the old situation. We're now going to um, uh, with 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 a, with a corresponding expression for the probability, the likelihood of this path. Uh, but one thing we can do now is we can already fill in some of the of the knowns here, some of the things that we just derived. Uh, we already calculated the probability of a uh, uh, of a scatter-free propagation over a length L1. That was this term here, this exponential term that we took years long. Uh, we also know what the probability of scattering uh, at, uh, at, at, at a certain location is. That is mu s times, times dx. It's the likelihood of scattering at a, uh, at a at, uh, at, at, over the short interval uh, uh, dx. Of course, I'm going to assume that mu s is homogeneous all, along, all across the sample, so that uh, so there does not have to be any spatial uh, dependence here. Uh, then uh, this function describes the probability of, uh, of changing direction uh, from, uh, from direction S1 to direction S2. Well, of course, uh, a function that describes these kind of uh, things is the phase function. So we can uh, later, um, uh, later use a phase function there. Uh, and then uh, uh, after that, uh, then we again have a, a scatter and absorption free propagation to, uh, 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 to uh, to uh, L, uh, over over length L two, uh, the scattering uh, uh, the probability of a scattering event again, and then a further change in direction, etc. 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 Until the photon uh, until the photon escapes. So this is again the anatomy of the uh, of the model. Um, so let's look at uh, uh, let's look at propagation along this line. Um, uh, so we have here uh, the propaga uh, a propagation in this case in the z uh, in the z direction, uh, uh, and, and 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 take a segment of that um, uh, of that uh, of that line with length l. Uh, probability uh, that a photon will travel a length l without any scattering at all, so with zero interactions, is by is given by this uh, uh, by this dear uh, expression by this uh, exponential minus mu s times l. Um, so then the, 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 then the next question is, what is now the probability of traveling that same length, that same length L, but then with one scattering event? Uh, so can you, can you now um, uh, help me break down this, uh, this, this event in sub-events? So what would be yeah, the sub-event? So I would say that we want to travel over a length L with only one, um, one uh, activity or scattering event. And so the probability that it is scattered over the um, distance L1 would be mu s, the scattering coefficient multiplied with L1. And then that probability, I think we also want to multiply that with the probability of um, the particle not being scattered over the distance L2. And so that um, second probability is, um, e to the minus uh, mu s times um, L2. Um, and also the, uh, yeah, no, I, I believe that, that that's it. And so then just multiply those um, probabilities with each other. Yeah, I, ag I agree with, uh, with the last part. Um, not entirely with the first part. Uh, what I would like to, uh, um, Propose is split it into three sub events. Uh, so, uh, so the scattering event is going to take place here. Um, so there you said, okay, there, there the, the, the probability of that happening is, is mu s times uh, a, a dl over there or a dx over there. That is correct. Uh, then the rest of the length is traveled without any interactions at all. So that is given by uh, by this ex uh, by an exponential term, exponential one, minus mu s times l two. Uh, but the propagation to the scattering effect, uh, event is also uh, 
uh, nothing happens there as well. That is also a interaction free propagation. Uh, so that also has uh, this ex uh, such an exponential term as, as a probability. Yeah, okay. And so then you make the DL of your um, where your scattering event is, you make that one just very small. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, so this would be a uh, so, th so then for this particular path, it would look like this. So we have a, a, a free propagation over length L1, uh, then, uh, uh, then, a, uh, then an, uh, um, then an uh, event with probability given by mu s uh, here at, uh, at, 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 at this uh, location one. And then uh, again, a interaction free propagation over the remainder over the length L2. So this, uh, um, the middle part I didn't yet fully understand because I thought it was mu s times the interval. Yeah, that, yeah. So it is a little bit notationally is, is a little bit obscure. I agree that so so mu s times the x is uh, uh, is the probability of uh, of having uh, this scattering event uh, in this interval. Yeah. So maybe maybe we should add the x here. That's true. And if we add the x, then it will be very small right because we let the x go uh, yeah. to the limit yeah yeah so yeah okay that's it yeah so so if if uh, if we add the x here uh, then it uh, then this whole probability becomes unitless so then this uh, this uh, remark here has to go if we don't include the x then uh, then this would be a probability per unit length that, that's a little a little bit obscure uh, but but let's if you look a little, uh, so, so let's let's keep with this notation for a moment. Uh, so L L one and L two together are uh, are equal to uh, to the total length L. Uh, so we can combine these two exponential uh, these two exponential terms into a single exponential term. Uh, so that means uh, exponential mu s times just L the whole length, uh, and then this uh, uh, and then this mu s. If I leave it like this, then this has a, this is a, a probability per unit length. Uh, if I add the x, it is a, is a true probability. Now the trick is uh, this uh, scattering event, this first scattering event, uh, can occur anywhere. So we were cal we were uh, interested in having propagation uh, uh, along this line with one scattering event. Uh, so what we calculated now was the specific case of the scattering event happening here, uh, but that scattering event can happen anywhere along the line. Uh, so according to, uh, uh, to our previous recipe, uh, we have to add all these options together. So all the, all the, all the possible locations of the first scattering event are all, um, are all uh, they, they all actually, actually define a unique photon path and we have to add, the, add these all together to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to calculate the total probability. And now, now finally, it uh, works out unit wise, uh, luckily. Uh, so add, adding adding these together means that we have to integrate the position uh, the position of the first one over over the length from zero to l. So the integral over dz1 uh, or dx uh, as I wrote it there uh, of um, uh, of mu s here uh, and then the exponential here um, and then of course the integral this this uh, this integral term here just evaluates to uh, to l. So the final uh, result is then mu s times l times exponential minus mu s times l for the probability, the total probability of, uh, of a photon traveling this distance l with one scattering event occurring. Does that, um, does that make sense? So the integral adds all the possible configurations, uh, all, all the possible ways in which you can go from, uh, uh, all the possible ways you can travel a length L with one scattering event. And then if you look at one specific uh, uh, version of that, then, uh, then the, the, prob the probability is given by mu s times uh, exponential minus uh, mu s times L. Uh, um, maybe uh, let's let, let's uh, let it sink in uh, for uh, for fifteen minutes, and then uh, uh, then we'll continue. Is that okay? Okay. So we'll start again at uh, 
uh, 22, 22 four. 